and fellowships. We have had in the course of this lectureship a very, very distinguished group of people, beginning with Bill Lenore in 1990, and uh, our last speaker in 1998 was Dr. John Logston from, uh, from DC. This afternoon's speaker is a friend of many of ours in this area, Dr. Peter Glazer, uh, retired a few years ago as the vice president, a vice president of Arthur D. Little, where he, uh, for many years, he founded and for many years ran the uh, space research program at Arthur D. Little. Uh, Dr. Glazer uh, was born in Czechoslovakia, uh, was educated in England at uh, Leeds College of, Techno of Technology as he uh, uh, was fortunate enough to escape from wartime, uh, for wartime Europe, received his degree there in 1943, and then listed in the uh, Free Czech Army which was part of the British Army and participated in the battle to, liber to liberate Europe uh, at one point in the progression through, uh, through Europe and that battle. The, uh, the Free Czech Army was transferred to the control of the US Army under General Patton and went as far as Pilsen at the time of VE Day, at which point uh, peace was declared. They were liberated and uh, uh, Peter returned to his homeland of Czechoslo Czechoslovakia for a nervous period of, several, of three years, wondering what the Russians were going to do, do about it. Uh, his parents had returned from Czechoslovakia to uh, be uh, uh, from England to Czechoslovakia. He took advantage of that time to uh, get a second degree in mechanical engineering from the uh, uh, from the Czech Technical University in Prague, and in 1948. Uh, when the Russians did uh, take over the role, rule of Czechoslovakia with a very firm hand, uh, he was fortunate enough to uh, be able to get out on just about the last plane uh, to the United States with his mother, uh, where he was able to convert his knowledge of mechanical en engineering and the $10 in a suitcase that he came to the U.S. with to a job uh, with a textile company uh, doing mechanical engineering in New York. They thought highly enough of him that they encouraged him to go for an advanced degree, which he did at Columbia University, getting a, a master's and eventually a PhD in mechanical engineering. The subject of his PhD thesis, which had to do with particulate matters in vacuum in 1955, turned out to be very key a few years later to the issue of trying to understand the lunar surface, which after all was particulate matter in a vacuum. And uh, Dr. Glazer was able to contribute a very, very important, uh, con very important contribution to the success of the U.S. Apollo program and lunar landing uh, program and the, and the l soft landings that took place before it by, it by analyzing the data that was coming back from looking at the lunar surface optically and concluding that in fact it was not a mile deep of, th of light powder as had been predicted by uh, some who were doubters of the possibility of, carrying, of being able to land anything at all on the moon. And as many of you know, NASA to the, uh, uh, in a bold step went ahead with the, with the plans for soft landing and was able to, uh, to succeed uh, remarkably. He, he initiated and ran uh, from 1955 on to his retirement in 1994, the space program at Arthur D. Little. Arthur D. Little, in the course of that, put more experiments on the moon than anyone else. Uh, and what he is probably best known for, for most of us, is the invention of the, uh, of the concept of space solar power. He is uh, the author of a book, uh, Solar Power Satellites, published by Wiley in 1997. And those of you who read Technology Review may recall that he was on the, his concept and his design was on the cover not, not too long ago. The, era, the issue of space solar power has once again, like a phoenix, arisen, and I think it's something that we will be wanting to pay a great deal of attention to. Without taking any more of his time, I'd like, you to, introduce our, I'd like to introduce our distinguished speaker, Peter Glazer. I'd, I'd, like, I'd like you to wear. I'd like you to wear both sure. of those things. That's for the television. This is for our.
Thank you very much, Professor Young, ladies and gentlemen, students, and visitors from the faculty. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to address you on a topic uh, which has occupied my interest for more than 30 years. I will try and, in my presentation, show you the slides because they do a far better job than my speaking to you, to show you that the concept that I have proposed publicly for the first time in 1968 is indeed worthwhile studying. And I'm pleased to share with you that today this is of major interest internationally and is being taken seriously all over the world. I will show you slides which hopefully will illustrate some of the points that I would normally want to make and uh, have you get a feel that what some people call science fiction is actually the reality in your lives. So if I may I wanted to just uh, start with this very short uh, quote from Stephen Jay Gould because we should not take for granted that the presence of humanity is guaranteed on planet Earth. And basically my feeling has been for these many years that behind this is the capability to utilize appropriate energy sources, find effective uses for the energy, and at the top of my list is to safeguard the Earth ecology in the broadest sense that it can be done. The point that I make here is that we are in a different world in the 21st century because we have to increase the living standards of people. We have to stabilize population growth, we have to safeguard the ecology, and we have to avert the specter of future wars. And how easy it is to start a war we, have, we are seeing right now. There are two aspects here that we have to bear in mind. First of all, global population, which is just about six billion, to sort of put this into perspective, when I was in high school, there were two billion people on Earth. We expect by the middle of uh, the century to be at around nine and towards the end, perhaps 14. Now, as more and more people increase their living standards. They need to use energy, although we do the best we can to minimize the wrong way of using energy. And if you look at terawatts of energy, we are around 14 now. We would be around 27 by mid-century and 42 at the end. These are unimaginable numbers based on what we now believe we have as energy sources. Totally unimaginable. This is a very simple example here. Oh yeah. Thank you. 
a very simple example. Five thousand eight hundred million tons, 1950, 18,700, 1985, and we now project 28,600. And the most interesting aspect is that the developing countries will use half of the energy in the world. And I always find that people don't realize that there are only two countries which really are important in the next century. One is China and the other is India, purely on population. Now there are a number of energy economists who try and predict when will we, you, when, when will we get to this highest point. Now some say we've already passed it. Some others say we will probably get it by 2010 and only a few say we will reach it by 2020. It is nearly immaterial when the act actual point will be reached. We have learned how to live with an ever increasing availability of energy. We have no idea what we will be doing as it is decreasing. And here's 2000. It's this fairly rapid decrease that we have to worry about. There is nothing in sight that will allow us now to say we will have the energy we need without destroying the ecology of the earth. Let me just show you the problem we are facing. If we utilize oil, gas, nuclear, it has already upstream effect, you know, coal mines, etc. We need water for electric power generation. And look, all the uh, sort of things that are happening in the air, in the water, on land, and if it's nuclear, we have the storage problem. So please keep that in mind, that those are the issues that the conventional, and I put nuclear among them, uh, have to face. Now look at the CO2 emissions. In the CO2 emissions, coal is of course the greatest culprit, oil, LNG, and only low ones are nuclear and solar power satellites. Now those of you who have studied nuclear power realize that it is a clean source up to a point because where the difficulty arises, we generate plutonium in the process unless we have developed fast breeder reactors, but even then we have some problems. Fusion is certainly a very interesting possibility at some time in the future. And I am a simple-minded engineer who says, I am 100% for fusion, 100% because I can now use an existing fusion reactor, which we call the sun. <laughs> what happens with CO2? Well, I like this cartoon uh, because it does indicate that we have a problem ahead of us. And this is the United Nations uh, study which came up with the results, what are the effects of sea level rise on people living in the Pacific. Now, you see the profound impact and so on. There are about 300 million people affected by this. Now, please imagine if we have a problem with the cost of Albanians and finding ways for them to live, what would we do with 300 million people and finding other places to live? All of that is not old stuff, actually. All of this was already known in the 60s. And it was because I was in a very fortunate position at Arthur D. Little uh, that I was able to 
work with people who knew all about power beaming or wireless power transmission. Raytheon was our neighbor. And so I was able to come up with what people then said was obviously science fiction. And that is, and that's the first artist concept, that we have solar cells. This was a disk which rotated so that we have very thin films. The power was fed to a transmitting antenna and directed back to the Earth where the power could be safely and very efficiently again converted into electricity. Now these were the, that's the exact slide I used in 68 and I have not changed my mind at all in terms of what are the criteria? Technical feasibility, economic attractiveness, ecological impact, social desirability, political implications and public acceptance. That is what I believe sort of all the things that we have to do when we develop new energy sources. Now let me go a bit in history. You know, I'm an engineer and as an engineer I've been taught over the years a good engineer basically has to be somewhat lazy because he has to look where are some good ideas that some of the physicists came up with so that we can adapt them. Well, here is one physicist whose name you know, Tesla. Because Tesla wanted, in 1908, he built this tower with money from Mr. Astor. And what he wanted to do is beam power. Now, he didn't quite succeed because the technology wasn't there, but he was on the right track. And of course, you realize that uh, without Tesla, we wouldn't have all the lights that we enjoy now. The other major interesting device which was developed by Raytheon was a microwave generator. Now this device, all of you know, you use it. Most of you use it every day in a microwave oven. Now, we, you know, we've got 300 million ovens in use now. Tremendous saving in energy. Now, in space, if we want to use wireless power transmission for use in space, we don't need glass enclosures, we don't need any of that stuff. And what we're left are those two little things. The magnets and the innards of a microwave generator. The second thing that we need is a way of converting microwaves directly into DC, which was considered an impossible task quite a few years ago, except a very good friend of mine, Bill Brown, who worked at Raytheon, who unfortunately died uh, just recently, developed the dipole rectifier, which converts the microwaves directly into DC. These are dipoles and here are the solid state devices which do this job. Now what you're looking at is one of the first microwave converters, the beam converters, the dipole rectifiers. Bill Brown, I think it was 1954, had an assignment from Rome Air Force Base to be able to build a helicopter which would stay up forever if power is provided from the ground. And lo and behold, he demonstrated that this helicopter, he has the blades, was able to fly as long as power is provided to it. A remarkable uh, demonstration. He also showed that this is a very efficient way of transmitting power. DC to DC conversion, uh, microwave beam, let's say my focusing this, the microwave beam and the collection. And if you look at all of this, 
at that time already it was about 55 percent efficient. That is from DC to DC. Now uh, you may recall that we've learned how to produce very large um, antennas. In order to give you an idea what the size of this antenna is, this is a truck here. So we know we can build phased array antennas, as these are called. They are used by the Air Force in various places. Where is that? That's in the Arctic, Antarc um, the Arctic region, Alaska. So back in 1970, with all this knowledge base, I had the temerity with my boss, who was at that time General James Gavin, uh, to be able to uh, meet with uh, the NASA uh, managers and dis explain to them what a solar power satellite could do. And NASA felt that indeed is a project of great interest to them and what they decided is to study this and uh, there was a team that was formed with Arthur DeLittle, Raytheon, Grumman, and uh, Spectralab, part of Textron. You see I had people in the East <laughs> who I knew who would work with us. And this was the first larger scale SPS system that was designed. Uh, solar cells on a large platform. Uh, this is an antenna. And the only moving part is the antenna because as this is in geosynchronous orbit once a day would have to move with respect to the Earth and there's uh, the bearing. Now you're looking at the underside of this uh, phase of the phased array antenna. Uh, this is where the wave comes out, the microwaves. Uh, here is the device which produces the microwaves. These that the, the microwaves are then fed into the rest of the antenna and these are uh, cooling devices so that it rejects any waste heat to space. Uh, here you see the antenna on the ground. Uh, please note that this is semi-transparent and we can still use the land underneath the antenna. It's a large uh, ground area that we need and we use a safety zone, and I'll have more to say about that. Well, this is, as you can see, the NASA SPS system, uh, circa of 1975. Uh, it's a very large area receiver, and uh, this is an area rectifying antenna. Uh, I was concerned that uh, NASA went a bit overboard because it was too large and the output of this was 5 gigawatts. Now that's uh, a very respectable energy output. Now if you recall the previous slide that I've shown for fossil fuels, this is the same slide now applied to satellite power systems. Much simplified and all the problems that you saw with the others, there is nothing happening on Earth in terms of waste products. There's a lot of, uh, you know, science and technology behind this. I just wanted to show you that it's fairly basic to understand what we need to do in terms of sizing. Uh, there's a parameter called tau and it's equal to the square root of the transmitting antenna and the receiving antenna divided by lambda, the wavelengths and the distance between the transmitting antenna and the receiving antenna. NASA realized that we need to have large uh, launch systems and therefore they, they've studied sea launch and that, uh, you know, is not uh, has not been forgotten because there's a company which wants to do that now again. 
Nobody believed that this can be done. You know, they said, well, these are just paper studies. I mean, how in the world would you really show us that this can be done? And so NASA allowed us to use Goldstone in 1974. And this Goldstone antenna site, we had the Venus antenna that we could use. That's the Venus, sorry, I got to get back here. That's the Venus antenna. And we put a microwave generating device at the focal point and then beamed from there to a receiving antenna on this large pole. And we had lights connected to it so that as we moved this antenna, we could show the lights dimming and so on, indicating that we were getting power. This is a view of the receiving antenna. And people ask me, well, why didn't you complete it? Very simple answer, we run out of money. These are the lights. And as we moved the antenna back and forth, you could see the lights dimming and getting brighter. There were questions, of course, asked. Now, what if you do something to heating up the ionosphere at the wavelengths that we are talking about, 2.45 gigahertz, by the way, it's in the ISM band, industrial scientific medical band, so we don't interfere with other people. And the concern was real. We didn't have the answer at that time. So what we did, we managed to get an experiment in the Arecibo large dish, and we had a diagnostic radar in uh, this location here in Guadeloupe, and therefore we were heating the ionosphere by putting energy into it, microwave energy. You see here's the microwaves being reflected by this huge dish, 1,000 foot antenna, going up through the ionosphere, and the radar showed us it's not heating up. Well, that was a great relief to all, and I think by then we had enough information and NASA had continued working on this till 1980. Uh, in 1980, the Department of Energy said, well, you know, we already believe that beyond this time, we will have nuclear power totally available in the United States and all of our energy will come from nuclear power. Furthermore, they said, that in 10 years, we will have demonstrated controlled fusion. So uh, essentially NASA was told, well, you don't have to work on it, and we'll do these other things. And uh, you know, we're still waiting for controlled fusion, of course. In 1986, there was a big study by the National Commission on Space in pioneering the space frontier. And here is sort of the key statement, what their ambition is, opening new resources to benefit humanity by combining energy of the sun with materials left in space during the formation of the solar system. Now what that means, going to the moon and building stuff on the moon itself. Now there are a lot of experiments and work that was ongoing then, and we were able to show uh, if we would have an uh, experiment with a shuttle, we could learn a lot and demonstrate how this works. And we were going to use a Spartan uh, free-flying platform, okay, free-flying platform which would beam to the shuttle. Uh, this was done with the, the Space uh, Center at Texas A&M University. And uh, we thought we nearly had permission to use a shuttle, but then uh, they wouldn't allow it. Because of the interest in all of this, uh, there were several other places where microwave power transmission was of growing interest, and one was in Europe. Uh, Europe has made a study that they cannot rely on renewable energy sources, and the only sources they can have are either nuclear or coal. And none of them, were, you know, remember some of the problems of uh, nuclear in Russia, etc., were attractive. So they said, 
what we'd like to do is take some of the power from South America. And uh, for example, Venezuela has a Guri Dam which has enormous capacity and uh, also in Brazil and various other places. So they said all we need is to have a reflector and that reflector then if we generate power from various sources here, that reflector will beam up and we reflect back. And we had a space uh, in uh, Spain allocated to this and it looked like a very interesting project. Uh, but the Europeans found out that it will cost more than they wanted to spend on this so they didn't go ahead with it. Now there's another aspect to all of this and that is where will people live? And we have studied the possibility of putting these antennas, receiving antennas, not on land because it takes land which might have to be used for raising uh, food but we put it in the ocean. And this shows you uh, the size of an uh, antenna for 5 gigawatts in the ocean. And it has a dual purpose because we can use it as a fish farm. You know, if you want to have salmon these days, it doesn't come from the rivers much. It comes from, I guess, Norway where they fish farm salmon. So here we have the possibility of dual usage. This just indicates how we uh, take care of the environment at sea uh, by having our dipoles and other stuff encapsulated and uh, it's supported there. Now this was not just a, a hypothetical experiment. Let's see if I can get this. Oh heck, I'll go back here. Can you? Uh, 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 oh, thank you. That's great. Uh, there was a big conference on ocean cities in 95, in fact there's another one uh, slated. And what's interesting, you know, we mentioned about the population growth. Uh, all of the attendees said we can't have all these people living on land, they have to live in the ocean. And that indicates to you where they will live. Uh, a typical question that people asked you know, how do we control that beam? A little to the west, Harry, we almost lost Detroit. And I think it's rather important to understand this is not a death ray. This beam has enormous energy which it can provide. But look at these numbers. The power density at the edge of the rectenna is one milliwatt per square centimeter. At the fence line, it's 0.1 milliwatt per square centimeter. And we expect that by the time we have it done, it will be down to 0.01 milliwatt. Now, if you live in New York or perhaps Boston, this uh, gets to be what you're exposed to from all the devices that you're using, particularly when you're listening to them on a phone. I just thought I'll show you the microwave field uh, exposure guidelines. The OSHA is, uh, that's, you know, industry uses large amounts of microwaves for various pur uh, purposes and uh, they're about 8 milliwatts and different organizations, let's say, go down to 5 and the public is exposed to 0.5. Well, you know, that's not too far removed from what we are talking about for the, the buildings at the edge of the antenna. The only sort of <coughs> group that has been very low is uh, uh, USSR and uh, this is a purely hypothetical level which of course they never achieved. If you use a microwave oven, you might be interested 
uh, what you're exposed to. And if you look at uh, uh, one milliwatt, you'd have to be within, you know, what, less than a foot, six inches of the microwave oven. Uh, by the time you get four feet away, uh, you really are at a very low level which you cannot be concerned about. And that's basically what we expect will happen at the receiving antenna as well. Now somebody asked me, well, what if it fails? Well, here is a failure mode. Eastern European standards and total failure, and this is partial failure, and the total failure would be around this level. Again, there's nothing that I believe needs to be done at that level, and we, of course, have some control over the things in orbit as well. Nobody believed us. You remember my offer of the goose flying? Nobody believed us that birds can fly through the beam and nothing happens to them. So we worked with the Boston University on an ornithology center and uh, studied with them the type of behavior, under what species, the exposure and flux density, and so on. And do they have any effect? We looked for all sorts of effects, and the upshot was no effect visible. Now, if we have a power density at great distance, we would be at around 10, oh, gee, wait a minute, I'm going to go back here. No, I'm going to. How do I get it back? It's uh, the second button. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, 10 to minus 4 milliwatt per square centimeter is sort of, if uh, we really are a long, uh, great distance away at that level, no concern at all about microwaves. There have been many other uses of this kind of approach. One is uh, a high-flying aircraft, uh, which uh, I've been studying, again, actually this was for the Air Force some years ago, and it looked like a very interesting approach. Now, the Japanese and many other countries have followed very closely our work. You know, it isn't classified and everyone can write papers about it. And in this uh, international space year, uh, they arranged to fly this kite, so to speak, and they had a Nissan truck, and this thing on flies. And here is uh, the device which makes it possible it's on top of the Nissan vehicle and the airplane. And therefore, as long as you provide power, the airplane will fly. The Canadians worked on it. They called it SHARP, Stationary High Altitude Relay Platform. All this is for communications purposes. And this round thing is a receiving antenna. It's done by the communications department in Ottawa. And it flies. The Japanese started to work on this probably in 1973. I had the pleasure of uh, meeting these people there in 1974 in Tokyo. And they really felt that this was the answer to their uh, to needs. They came up with what's called the SPS 2000 project. And, uh, you know, it's the same idea. You beam from solar cells and you beam back to Earth. And this wasn't hypothetical. As you can see, they actually started to build these structures and trying to understand how to design those kind of structures. They had a visit uh, of various people here, a whole group of them, under interesting Japan external trade organization, to talk about their R&D and what we are doing and what can be done. 
Another thing that has happened in Japan is uh, dirigibles. Uh, you know, if you want to have a dirigible to stay up forever, what you do is uh, have a transmitter which sends a signal to the array, produces power so that it's kept up there. And there it flies forever if you'd like to have it fly, doing all the things from uh, the altitude, for example, communications. Another thing that the Japanese did, and I think a very interesting project, this was a rocket on which they mounted transmitters and receivers of microwaves. These are just some of the details of it. Again, uh, we worked with Texas uh, A&M on it, and uh, they developed uh, uh, dipole rectifiers, uh, which uh, are two-dimensional. And now you see the whole rocket. And this is what it was supposed to do, and it did it. The microwave experiment transmission system beamed power from the rocket to a satellite. Now that is a very important demonstration with a lot of interesting possibilities. In Germany it was of great interest as well. If you, this is uh, uh, power from space. The Russians, uh, of course, followed what we were doing very closely. And uh, I was at in the 1980s, the chairman of the Space Power Committee of the International Astronautical Federation. And we had some Russians on the committee. And I said, fellas, we're telling you what we are doing. We'd like you to tell us what you're doing. And so in 1985, October, in the Stockholm meeting, a very senior scientist, uh, Professor Sarkisjan of the Moscow Aviation Institute in the Cosmos Council, gave us his paper saying what we are doing. This is a very interesting uh, thing. Look at it. In 1990, somewhere around here, they were going to light up the Earth from space. Then they would energetic transmission of energy through space, and so on, ending up with solar power satellite demonstration by 2010. They have pictures of some of their devices. I don't know if you've read it, but on schedule that time, they launched a giant space mirror. Now the reason for learning how to do that is because the thin film solar cells are then mounted on the mirror. It isn't just to reflect sunlight. That's a good thing to tell the people in the press. And this is a mirror during deployment. Uh, they had hoped, NRG had hoped to do this earlier this year, but unfortunately they, the mirror, which was 85 feet diameter, collided with uh, the spacecraft and it didn't deploy, which is too bad. They did another thing which we have to look at was quite a feat. From Mir, uh, they called it a Mir plasma beam they sent to a Swedish satellite called Freya. Now I'll let you imagine what this means with some moving things in orbit and it was a successful experiment. Therefore, just showing you the sophistication that these people already have for it. NASA uh, has recovered from the defeat of DOE's, uh, uh, you know, stopping their program in 1980, and about two years ago started what's called a fresh look on space power. And this made the front page in May 1997 of Aerospace America. Uh, they have now $15 million to study it at the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. And as you can see, it looks different than the old NASA SPS reference system. It has very interesting advantages, so there's lots you can read about it. You probably recognize this picture. And uh, 
I have lived on the moon vicariously for many years, so I have great interest in doing the things I've just told you on the moon, and I couldn't help but uh, show you this experiment, the laser ranging retroreflector experiment, uh, was placed on the moon July 16, 1969, by Buzz Aldrin, a good friend of mine. And it's the only experiment still being used by about 70 investigators, not just to measure the Earth's moon distance, but all sorts of other things. There's a laser built into a telescope at Haleakala Mountain on Hawaii, sends a beam uh, of laser and a pulse laser, and we can measure time accurately, etc. This is sort of a high school problem, how you can determine the distance from the telescope to this device very accurately. We've studied all sorts of things that would be done on the moon and how we can use that. And uh, of interest is that we can utilize the energy on the, near the northern and southern poles and have it continuous and then feed it to antennas like you see in the background and beam power back to Earth as well as what I have uh, proposed that if we have a laser which is uh, powerful enough and we have all the power there we need, we can change the uh, way asteroids and other kind of unpleasant visitors come into our neighborhood by directing them into another orbit. There's a business here as well, of course, and uh, that's why many countries are very interested, and I've mentioned a few of them. Uh, it may be perhaps uh, a bit uh, uh, optimistic to say that services in energy will start uh, in about three, four, five years. However, it's a lot cheaper to provide energy to space station and to other uh, kind of things we have up there than to rely on uh, batteries. So I think this is uh, an additional possibility that I see coming. Now, what's my vision for the future? It has to be consistent with economic and political realities. It has to be acceptable to global village inhabitants and actionable by industry and uh, other decision makers in government. So that is a very quick uh, sort of journey into space looking for power and uh, I'll be delighted to try and answer some of your questions. Thank you. Questions for Dr. Hi. You, you, you made a very good case for solar energy. I mean, you can't, you can't refute it. But how, how does it compare to ground collecting solar energy? Uh, okay, that's a very good question. Let me say I am one of the biggest supporters of utilizing as much solar energy on the ground in renewables. I served as president of the International Solar Energy Society and therefore my, I'm impartial. Whatever we can do in the ground, I think we have to do. That's a problem. On the ground, it's a one-shift operation in space. It's a three-shift operation. In other words, the sun shines there continuously. On the ground, we have not only day and night, but weather conditions. And that makes it difficult for the kind of large-scale power production that we have in mind. We should do all we can on the small scale thing, uh, hot water heaters on the roofs, etc. Whatever we can do on the ground will be fabulous. But on the bigger scheme of things, it will not be enough to replace the fuels that we now use. Are there any uh, current application areas for microwave power transmission, say land, point to point on land, that will drive the development of these technologies because they're currently economically... I'm delighted you asked the question. Uh, we have worked with uh, the state of Alaska because uh, they have places where they want to beam power that away because the cost of laying uh, power cables across uh, 
inlets and so on is very expensive. And uh, we have identified this as a very interesting thing. If you go to the University of uh, Alaska at Fairbanks, you will find that uh, they have taken the, uh, all the equipment that NASA had at Goldstone, you know, which we used, and transported it there for exactly that purpose. And they're engaged in finding out where does it make sense. For example, the native population wants power, and to get power to them is exceedingly difficult. So that's underway, it's a very interesting possibility. The disadvantage is that you can't do it next week. Uh, we have to have a number of things going. I've discussed primarily the system itself. Now, I have not discussed how do we get there from here. You know, as long as it costs us a fortune per pound to lift things into geosynchronous orbit, this will not be a good way of going. I'm convinced that there are better ways of lifting uh, materials from the Earth into orbit. One that I have worked on is uh, magnetic acceleration. And uh, most of the stuff I've shown you can withstand 10,000 Gs. So that's one aspect. We have to change our view of how we place material into orbit. The second, we cannot have astronauts, as skilled as they may be, and my friends doing with wrenches and hammers and screwdrivers putting this together. The only way I think this can be done, if you look at the scale, is by having robots and robotic assembly. We've learned it on the ground. Go to any large assembly plant, you don't see many people around. It's done robotically. People are still required to guide the robots. Basically, this is something that we will have to learn. Again, we have started to look at robotic assembly in space. Can you imagine what it took to assemble the International Space Station? The risks our astronauts had. This is where we have to learn how to do it robotically. I believe it is possible, and there are people studying it. I'm sorry. What, what kind of solar cell would you use? Oh, uh, well, my preference is uh, gallium arsenide cells or cadmium telluride, a number of very good materials which you can use in very thin film layers so that the mass of that stuff, uh, NASA and the SPS references, believe it or not, try to talk them out of it, use uh, crystalline, uh, single crystal silicon solar cells which was not the way to go because they're thick and heavy and so on. Thin film cells, which you already can see. For example, I had a, a discussion with a man from the Yoffe Institute. I don't know if that means something in Len Leningrad. Uh, there, the National Renewable Energy Lab in equivalent uh, in Russia. And they have developed solar cells which are about the size of the nail on my pink, which are 25% efficient. And there's hardly anything there, and they use the concentrator. So there are novel ways to utilize thin film cells at hardly incomparable to what we now use. And I believe those are the kind of developments that are on, uh, in the laboratory now and will eventually be applied. Jay Forster here at MIT has developed a uh, model of world dynamics. And that was kind of developed further by um, Meadows Group and so forth and uh, beyond the limits, limits to growth and so forth. Now, have you coordinated this project with his model? Okay. Have you uh, into one? system that we could take the variables and model and put it into his model and see whether the world will go into uh, 
crisis. And he's seeing the key crisis as, uh, as uh, an exponential growth in the population, problem with food and so forth. And uh, he sees the crisis occurring later in the 21st century. Uh, I'm familiar with, with this and I fully agree with it and I believe the only way that we can s reduce population growth is if you study the American system of population growth. At higher living standards you don't have to have large families because you're assured that uh, one or two are enough for you to have people who will take care of you in the old age. And I think that these models are very important. The inputs that they can get, and I would suggest, for example, from the NASA people and the Fresh Look study would be very important to integrate because I'm a technical optimist and I believe that there is within our collective brains enough new idea that we can do all these things without seeing the end of the world. Yeah, um, I'd like to start off by saying I've been a big fan of the solar power satellite concept since I was maybe 12 years old. I've been following it for a long time. But I think you point out really well the two major obstacles, which are the launch costs and the construction costs. But I think you downplayed the difficulty of robotic assembly in unstructured environments such as space. Sure, we have lots of things on the ground that use robotics in factories, which are very, very structured environments. So I just wondered if you had a little bit more to say about, do you really think that robotic technology is going to advance to the point that we could build something 20 kilometers long? Well, actually, uh, I believe to some extent it will, but there is a limit to this. And I don't believe having this in orbit around the Earth is the right place at all. You saw the slides that I've shown to convince you uh, that we should go back and look at the moon as a place to put these for a number of reasons. And the primary one is we have the materials there, the cost of materials, we, they're the same kind of materials we have on Earth and therefore we can establish the materials that we need up there and have the factories to make them. We don't have to have these enormous uh, uh, heavy lift launch vehicles that NASA you know, was thinking about. And I believe that there the assembly again is a lot easier than in orbit. And that the robots may be required for certain things if you not, to get us to that stage. But eventually I think being on the moon will be the answer because we're on Luna Ferma you know, not just terra firma. And you don't feel that the presence of D in the denominator of the, tra of the efficiency equation is... A, is uh, I don't think so. I think we can, uh, we would probably have a mirror rotating uh, in, in a Earth position which would uh, allow us to do without the rotation. You know, the mirror itself then well, deflates. I just think of your equation the square root of the, square root of the uh, product of the two areas divided by left. Yeah. D, and that D is very large from moon. Or is that the... Well, no, that's, that's a distance, yeah. This is just one last question. Um, related to that question and the point of my meaning question, are there any um, companies or places in industry that you know of that are trying to sort of bootstrap the process since this is obviously very expensive and can't expect governments to fund anything until there's some major energy crisis? Well, uh, at at this point, it's primarily still NASA, which is uh, now in uh, other countries, it is the government as well. And you know, today, and uh, I didn't mention that the Chinese are very interested, the Europeans, the Japanese, the Russians, the Ukrainians, you know, it's, it's uh, if you want to be uh, at a meeting, well, the next, we had one in Tokyo on January 9th, we had one on Reunion Island, which was organized by a CNES, a French space agency, and if you know that's in the Indian Ocean because they want to use it there. And uh, we have uh, another one coming up at the Space Studies Institute in May, and at Unispace 3 is uh, a whole day devoted to this. So I think there's a lot of people who are now involved in it, 
and hopefully the various people like yourself come up with new ideas and better ideas than we have had so far. Thank you. Let me, before closing, just uh, introduce uh, three people. Uh, we're, we're pleased to have Dr. Al Sacco with us. Al is a uh, former fellow specialist and is director of our uh, sister institution, the Center for Commercial Development Space at uh, Houston University. Uh, Pete Young with, uh, of the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics is the uh, associate director of Space Mass Spacecraft and was responsible for inviting Dr. Glazer to be with us today. And Helen Howers in the uh, back of the room, the Glazer had Helen. Helen is the uh, coordinator for the Massachusetts Spacecraft Consortium, and as many of you get to the stages where you are interested in either applying for uh, your office or fellowship applications uh, to Spacecraft, you will come in contact with Helen, who also is responsible for the refreshments which we'll be sharing with Dr. Glazer in a few moments. I have this. Certificate of Appreciation for Dr. Glazer, uh, the 10th Annual Public Lecture for his uh, space polar, his lecture on space, solar power, and energy supply system for Earth. Thank you. For your Thank time. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.